I'm Dewan Johnson, and I'm excited to introduce you to my Think Bigger Actor podcast, where I'm going to share with you different kinds of talks and coachings and conversations with actors and industry professionals on thinking bigger. I hope these conversations will help you on your path to success, because I believe success is an inside job that starts with your mindset and the thoughts you hold dominant in your mind. Change your thoughts and you change your world. Your path to thinking bigger begins now. Brian, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing today? Doing good, doing good. I it's 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 in the afternoon and I have coffee because I have kids. And <laughs> you gotta find a way to get through it. I'm sure the kids were in concentration through this pandemic. So I think you found your strategies to help you through the day. You do what you got to do. Thank you for seeing me. Thank you for seeing me. Right. I, I want to jump right in because I am so excited to talk to you. I have so many great questions, but I'm going to start with some rapid fire stuff real quick. All right. All right. You ready? Okay. okay. I'm going to uh, stretch it out real quick. <laughs> All right. Rapid fire question number one. What's your favorite role you've ever played? My favorite role I ever played? I'll, Paul Strickland right now because I'm doing a little Paul. bit of everything that I like. Everything I like. Yeah, cool, cool. What's your dream role or the role you're dying to play? Um, I want to be in a action comedy where I get to like run around, do the stunts, jump off roofs and things like that, save the day, and just be amazing. Can we just be honest real quick? Like, I don't want to do my own stunts though. Everybody's like, <laughs> everybody's like, Juan, do you want to do your own stunts? I'm like. I'm not about that business. They pay, we pay people handsomely. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to do, I'm going to do one or two. All right. I'm going to do a couple of them, but you know, it just depends on my level of uh, abilities. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 All right. Okay. Last question here for rapid fire. Why did you become an actor? It's like a part of my essential being. I feel like it's part of my, my purpose of, you know, being on this planet. It's my, my life's mission. I feel like to express things physically. Yeah. You use the word purpose there. Right? And I love that. I love that. I, I like to say that there are people out there who became doctors because their purpose was to really, you know, fix in that way or astronauts or scientists and stuff like that. And this is my purpose. This is how I give back. This is what I do here, here in, um, in acting and in coaching as well. So I love that word. I caught on to it real quick, real quick. <laughs> well, listen, I was reading up on you and I was just like, I was like, this is fascinating. You, you got, you got the title here. The first black trans man cast in a series, regular world. Come on, Come on network man. TV. Let's get them. <laughs> Break down some barriers, baby. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Congratulations. That is, I want to hold space for that. Did I, you know, like for that, that is, that's huge, you know, and we're talking about network TV, you know, probably cables, you know, been doing it. I don't know what they're doing at cable, but you know, but this is huge. And I just want to hold space for that, you know, sit in that awesomeness. How's that feel? I no, I've, I very much appreciate it. And I think every now and then it's good for me to also just kind of sit in, in just that achievement. Cause I get so caught up in like, okay, what am I doing? What am I, what am I crafting that the artistic part of it? I spent a lot of years trying to just become a series regular period. You know, mm -hmm. and so to work my way up the ladder from literally background work and improv, unpaid improv theater shows in Brooklyn, you know, to becoming a series regular was important. But then to be able to, again, bring my both my purposes together to bring my entire self, my story or elements of my story to help people better understand people who are not like them. Mm -hmm while doing what I love to do through performance and being able to reach people who may who may not know that they already encountered somebody who's going through what I'm going through mm -hmm. or who may be going through what I'm going through and think they're the only ones to have mm -hmm. the opportunity to do all those things with one role. Again, it's just that I was like, this is what I'm here to do. This is my purpose. Everything I feel like I've done up at this moment has prepared me to do this. And I just felt so glad that I was ready when the opportunity came you know i did my training so i felt good about that i had worked within the, the community the lgbt community worked with young people i you know studied film and tv and production so i just feel like everything just sort of added to that moment so that you know when when the opportunity came i was prepared so preparation and opportunity it was like luck and i was and i was actually in los angeles you know able to audition instead of sending in a tape like everything just you know worked for this moment yeah. to happen. And I feel so glad that I was able to A, be the person selected to do it. And right. then B, feel like I can carry it in the, and, you know, carry what, what I've been, what's been bestowed upon me, you know, yeah. least I, I feel like I'm carrying it, you know, but. Uh, yeah, no, you are. I, I, I we're going to get into this in a, in a little bit, but 
forgive me because time is a little warped because of the pandemic. <laughs> you know, I know, <laughs> you know, I know that um, uh, 911 Lone Star, did it come out pre-pandemic? Because I know we have 911 that's been out, you know, for a bit with, but I'm just like, I'm like, was that right before the pandemic? Yes, was that, we, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> because it was a time, even for me, it was like, uh, everything happened all at once. It felt like I was working on the L word in the summer mm -hmm. and uh, I booked a uh, 911 like at the end of the summer. And so I had to like switch over to, to that show. We started filming in September of 2019. And our, I think we finished shooting on like February 22nd or something like that. Yeah. Of 2020. Okay. So it's like, 2020. Like, so right we before. just miss the wave of productions having to be shut down and and like you know feeling the full ramifications of the pandemic like as it happened you know so it was it was interesting because it felt like i put a lot of again it put a lot of work into you know getting my career wanted to be you know getting to be able to work at the, the level of work that i wanted to do like creatively with this show and uh, then things were starting to get traction like i had wanted to come out west i was meeting people that i had been interested in working with and i'm connecting with them and it felt like everything was moving in this direction the pandemic was like you thought <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, you, oh you had a plan oh you had a plan <laughs> that you know but i i have to say i was incredibly fortunate that we we came back like we got announced to come back i think in in may late april and may of 2020 so that was like a weight off my chest because a lot of shows were canceled a lot of productions were really pushed and it was like i just started to feel a sense of um security and like the freedom that the creative freedom that comes with security and the personal freedom that comes with that sense of security once you sort of uh reach something you've been working towards for a long time so i was like just about to start to you know rest in that and the pandemic came and i was like well you know what you can still relax and reevaluate within this period. You know, we still got you. We're all going to get through this. The bottom is not going to completely drop out. It's just going to be different. So there was this restructuring that happened. And I feel like from May until July, I just was like, where whatever happens, happens. Mm -hmm. Very much case sera, sera, you know. And let's focus on the things that I think I wasn't paying as much attention to because either I was in survival mode trying to hustle as a, you know, hungry New York actor or just this big transition and shift in life change was, was happening around me and I was doing my best to, to keep up. The pandemic sort of said like, breathe, look around, take stop. Yeah. Let's get prepared for whatever's going to come next when things start to open back up, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I have to say that I didn't think about it and, and listening to you that, you know, uh, we were one of the first shows on Bosch to come back like mm. in 2020. So we came back at the end. I think we started shooting, if memory serves, about uh, September. I think uh -huh. we started on September right after Labor Day. And then we went all the way until February. Right. And so that e we'd already been announced we'd come back for a seventh season, but it was kind of like that, like you're saying, that ease of like, okay, at least this is still happening. We're good. It's a, it, it's some sense of normal. Right. We don't know what it's going to look like, but we're going back. Okay. Right. Right. But yeah, but, but pandemic shooting was crazy. I have to just say pandemic, oh. we know, and I don't know if you all did this, but we shot through December, which we had never done throughout all Christmas like all we, we went right up to Christmas and then we came back like two days after and it was like it was a lot. So I, I, I do appreciate mm -hmm. that for sure, that it's like uh, it, it did have some sense of normalcy there for that. But I, I, I'm, I'm so I'm so just like time warped. And so I'm glad you cleared that up for me. So I was like, when was nine? Well, and Angela's not on that. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, so, okay. yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's good. So listen, I read a quote though. I want to. I just want to. I want to. I want to. I want to misquote you. Like so, maybe somebody else did. But I, I read a quote that you where you stated like you started your career post transition, and because you are not visibly trans, you had the privilege of choosing to disclose or not disclose. You uh, you said, and I, I just want to say like a lot of actors, you know, fear coming out. Right, they had that fear of coming out in the GLBT community. Sorry, LGB community plus that you know i don't know <laughs> coming out and, and not being able the letters. To there was another matter of order as long as the letters were in. On in there um you know the, the cisgender roles uh, but but but, but the, you know they fear not being able to play those cisgender roles you know is that something that ever crossed your mind or have you ever thought by you know coming out with that it crossed my mind like but i was in a place again where i was very uh, just purpose focused i'm like mm. i was really asking myself you know after i felt like i understood the craft and how to craft. And then it was like, you know, how to tell stories. And I understood more about like the industry and this is how procedural works and this is how, you know, sitcoms work. So I felt like I had this domain 
knowledge and I felt exercised enough to continue as like a professional. But then I started to act as an artist. Mm -hmm. What can I bring to a story? What can I as an actor bring to a script, a character that, you know, nobody else can? And what am I personally interested in exploring now that I feel like I have enough tools in my toolbox and I feel comfortable enough being vulnerable. And I'm like, well, the stories that I want to tell are about black, black men. I want to explore black masculinity. And then I want to explore it through my trans experience because there's other tr black male actors out here acting, but I have this unique, you know, perspective and experience. I really want to bring that. And then I, I noticed that there is a lot of people who just don't really have a full understanding of mm -hmm. what our experience is out. It, what our experience is, especially outside of the, oh, please accept me for who I am. I'm coming out. And, you know, the, the transition and the medical stuff, there's all this other life. And there's so much use, universality within that other bit of life, whether it's, you know, mm -hmm. the other half of your life or wherever you decide to make this particular transition. And then there's a lot of, I felt like, parallel transitions that we all sort of make in our lives that I was, I was interested in sort of showing through the work because yeah. I could be an advocate. I could be an activist. I could go to marches. I could, you know, do talks and things like that. But it's like, I want to, I want to perform. I want to do it through character work. I want to do it through storytelling. And so I was open. I was very much more driven by that than the fear of like, what am I going to miss out on? It was like, but what can I, what am I put here to do more so than what am I going to lose out on? You know what I mean? So yeah. at that time in like 2017, I was, I guess 2016 before I booked Queen Sugar, that's where my mind was at. It's like, I want to, I want to do, I want to say specific things. Like what do I want to set my work? What do I want to do creatively? And this is the area I want to, I want to focus on. I want to lean into at this point, you know, cause yeah. you know, I, I've played like right now, like three very different, unique, interesting to me, trans masculine characters. And now I'm like, okay, now what do I want to explore? I want to mm -hmm. explore, you know, I'm religious. I want to explore more about the black experience, the Midwest you know, transplant experience into other places, you know, what, you know, so that's kind of where I'm at right now. And I'm not, again, I'm, I don't carry fear. I'm aware that it's possible that maybe some people won't see me as the leading man, the, the romance industry. Is it, it's possible that, you know, me being cast in a role now will make it a trans project, even if it's not, that's all possible. I can't control that. But what I can sort of control is following my interests and that sense of purposeful push and just, you know, following that, you know what I mean? there's just so much to unpack there right <laughs> there's just so much to unpack and if you all are watching or listening to this you could see my face I was like where do I go with all of it and I'm just going to start with this this little piece that you said that was so fleeting so quick I don't carry fear I know what I think that means mm -hmm. but what does that mean Brian you remember saying like, that? Yeah, I do. And again, I know what I mean by it because I say like it's present. Mm -hmm. Either it's coming from within, something comes up to me that is, oh, discomfort or, you know, uh, a, a loss of something could happen. Like I have, I experienced the feeling of it, but then I, I don't carry it mm -hmm. with me. I like, I say, there you are. And then I go, well, we're going we're gonna, we're gonna to try to find a way to do it anyway. Or there you are. I need some help because <laughs> this is what yeah. I'm trying to do. And I, this yeah. fear is very very big, you know, so I, I know it's there. And sometimes again, it's like the fear that's sourced within me or sometimes the fear within the people around me. And like, sometimes I, at one point in my life, I realized I was making decisions based on fear other people had on my behalf. Like I really wanted to play football and my mom was like terrified that I was going to get hurt. And so then I found myself, even though I had been playing in the neighborhood, I found myself as I was crossing the parking lot to go play, like scared. And I'm like, that's, I'm not scared. I'm not. You know, that's not me, you know, it's the same thing with like, you know, even a lot of like big life decisions when it came to moving to New York, you know, so my mom was scared when it came to moving to Los Angeles, my wife was scared, you know, there's, and I'll realize like I will internalize at times other people's fears and I'll hold it as if it's my own, but mm -hmm. I try as often as I can not to carry fear with me, like yeah. let it happen. Don't, I don't try to stop it. I don't try to pretend it's not happening because that is a whole nother sort of can of worms, but it's like, if I can acknowledge it, I can say, yeah, I'm scared. This is, this is scary. And then just kind of keep going. Usually what I want to happen happens. I love that. I love that. And you know, what we call that in my world, I call that, I should say in my world, sometimes what we do is we borrow other people's beliefs. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And those, and those beliefs become expired and just like mm -hmm. expired milk, milk, we don't like go back and excavate those borrowed beliefs. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so I love where you're, you're crossing the street and you're like, wait, 
Whose spear is that? And like, yeah, you know, <laughs> I've been so many times. Like, I can both ways. I see ain't nothing coming. What am I? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I love that. That that that's beautiful. And the other thing you said was about really wanting to show your the, your experience from your eyes and seeing it. What do you give? What is your purpose? You know, I did a show called uh, a YouTube uh, series where I was the lead in called uh, The New 30. And it was about this uh, black gay man actor. Like, and I was just like, they're like, do you want to do that? You're doing this, you know, detective, you know, guy, and you, you want to do this? And I said, you know what? I'm tired of people telling the black gay experience the way that I don't see myself in. So I want to get up there and let me tell this story the way I want to tell, because I don't see it whether, and I, and, and all the whole spectrum is correct. I want to say everybody's experience, what they're doing is correct. But I was like, I want to show the, the Dewan's version of this, you yeah. know, of this yeah. experience. And so, yeah, I, I get behind that like 120%. Right. It's wild. Like when you think about it, like, you know, because the people ask me, then my own, I have to like come to this conclusion myself. And then when people ask me, you know, like, what can they like, how, you know, how, how do they break in? How do they become an actor? Like, you know, basically like, why would anybody pick me? Why would a casting director pick me? Why would a director pick me? And it's like, because we're all prisms. Like mm-hmm. the way things come to us and it's filtered through us and the way it's going to come out is, is going to be so different. Mm-hmm. You know, we can all look at the same script and it's going to come out of us different. You know what I mean? And like your refraction is just as valuable as the next person so it's like do you because yeah, nobody well, else can well here's like i gotta say can, yes you know yes but the problem is that's a beautiful analogy but the prism what mm-hmm. happens is it refracts and you see our own beautiful light like you're saying mm-hmm. but what we do and don't co-sign on this if you don't believe me mm-hmm. but what what we do as actors are like oh i see my light but what do they want i'm gonna try to move right. it to this other way right. Uh, it's we like, were uh, only just gonna uh, hit the angle more so like the way that that one said, you know, and like we are, it's weird because it's a commodified art. So it makes, they have to figure out the form that's, or that they think is going to make them money. So they're going to try to tell you, bend this light this way because we can't afford this person. Mm-hmm. But if you can do something similar to that, then we'll hire you, bend yourself. But... <laughs> We're yeah. artists. So it's like we have to find a way to maintain as much of the way that we put our light out yeah. and still be marketable. You know what I mean? Yeah. But oh. that comes from us. You have to be kind of grounded in yourself to be like, I'm OK with you saying no to me because I don't want to bend like that. I'm OK with you saying no to me. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's not what we taught. We're taught. No, I can do anything. I can be yeah. anything. I can do all this stuff. And it, what I have started to understand is also it creates a fever pitch. Mm-hmm. It creates this weird, and you're in your like this weird mo- mold of yourself, and you're like, I can do it all. You're like walking like this, and you're not yeah, even. It doesn't make sense. It's yeah. uncomfortable. There's no mm-hmm. spontaneity anymore because all your energy has went into holding up this facade. Yeah. You know what I mean? But if Ooh. you like put it down, you can just go, oh, I can do whatever I want to do, and anything. Yeah. You can really listen. You can tr- really respond. Yeah. Because you you put it down. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Listen, you've you've done so much. You've done so much. I've been like looking at IMDb, and you know, I've been, I've been, I've been, I've been stalking. <laughs> I'm I'm like, what's up? What's up? You know, what 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 would you say would be your breakout, like your breakout audition or your breakout role? Role, I would say. I, I know what I think it is, but I'm I'm not gonna you know presume I know because I'm not that person. But you know, how about you? Um, I, I would I would say my break in role was on Girls. It was like my first real uh, credit in something that you know it was seen by a lot of people with a casting director in New York that was you know pretty pretty well established and you know so I was like and and that kind of really put me on the map you know in terms of like just literally breaking in and and moving moving the change forward. But I say my breakout role would definitely be Queen Sugar playing Twine yeah. on uh, on Queen Sugar for sure because it gave me an opportunity to. Be more expansive as opposed you know there's there's co-star roles where you serve a function to help the story like I'm, I'm i'm telling the story and again you use your light you color it the way you want to but really it's like you're here to let the people know this is how you get from point a to point b and that's that's move the, the story along move the story, move along. The story along. yes mm-hmm. and with twan it was like this is a whole person whose function is in relationship to one of the lead characters mm-hmm. and really helping him not just moving the story along but moving the person along mm-hmm. and he had to be a fully fleshed out person in order for that to really work. And what was really great about the way that they shoot Queen Sugar is it feels like theater to me. Like they really let the scenes breathe and take their time. I, I feel like 
you can watch Queen Sugar and they, you can go a full 10 seconds when it's two people, no dialogue. And it's just something was said and they just responded to it. So it, it like really allows things to happen. So I feel like because I connected with Tuan, I, I really connected to what the situation was in the, in the scene, that the, the opening scene. And then they let us just be alive in it. So much of what I wanted to put out in the world and say as an artist was captured in that. And I feel like there was a response to it because of that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it allowed me to move forward to have more opportunities to do work like that in other projects. Yeah, I was going to say Twan. Yeah, yeah. but <laughs> I was good. That was what I was going to say. But I love how you broke that down to a break in role and a break out role, right? Mm -hmm. I like the, I never thought about it that way. You know, I think sometimes what I have talked about on this podcast and what I've felt in my, my career is that there are these roles that we think we break in with and we think that's the one. That's the one that's going to be the one to get me to that, that you know what I mean? And then it, it's, it's good. It gets you in. Mm -hmm. People know you, but you still got more yeah. to do and stuff. And so I love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I booked, I booked girls, I feel like in 2012 or, mm. or no, 2014. And I didn't book Twine until 2017. So I was still working here and there, but you know, I was still doing like co-star roles. And I, you know, like some of them were similar to that. And then some of them were like a little bit more, a little closer to, uh, you know, guests. It was definitely like, hey, I'm in, I'm established. These casting directors now know that, you know, they can call me in for certain types of roles, but it, I didn't break out into the next tier, I feel like, until Twan. And then like, I, I feel like if you think about it that way, you're setting yourself up to like to keep going because like, mm -hmm. okay, so I broke out of, you know, move the story along type characters. Yep. And now I'm into, you know, more like come in and add to the story full fleshed out characters. Like, you know, Twan's recurring. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until Lone Star where I broke out of that into mm -hmm. like, I can, you, I'm going to see, you're going to see me every week and my character's going to develop over time. Somebody's going to develop over seasons. So I broke out into that. So now I'm thinking the next thing I want to break out into is not only is my character, you see him every week, but my character's situations drive the whole of the story, not just the A story or the B story or whatever. Yeah. So it's, yeah. you know, I, I want to move it. I want to break into that sort of realm next you know what I mean? we call that we call what you just did visioning and manifestation i'm not i'm i'm not gonna let this like slide what you just did you just said listen universe i'm ready for the lead of the show i'm ready to be number one so i can <laughs> and you know that's like, what i heard because i mean like I, I feel like for sure the reason why i'm doing exactly what i'm doing is because i had to get specific i felt like i kept hearing it in my acting class be specific be specific yes. and i thought it only applied to the craft and the work I was like no with everything so there was that time when I first started acting, I was like, I just want to act. I just want to act on the matter. Then I had to be like, okay, no, I want to act. I want to get paid to act. Thank you. I'm about to say. And I was like, so that was like, next, I want to get paid to act. And I was like, well, I like, well, what kind of acting? I like theater like this. And then it was like, no, I want to do TV. Now I'm not doing TV. Okay. I don't just want to do TV. I want to be in these particular shows. I want to be these kinds of characters. I want this size of a role. I want to be in this particular city. Like I got, I kept getting, I was, I, I wouldn't allow myself again, that fear. I realized I'm internalizing, like even my reps fear, you know, like don't go out West and start from scratch. I'm internalizing other people's fear that came, came in the form of advice in some ways, but it's really limiting to me in terms of what I saw for myself. And then the exercise again specific, let me like be really honest about like, what do you really want? Because at one point I was like, I want to get paid more than I've been paid before. I want to work on the West Coast. I want to, you know, develop a character over time. And they ended up booking a play in Portland, Oregon, which was great. But I was like, you don't want to be in Port. You don't, you want to be in Los Angeles. So I wrote it down in my little, my vision board. It was like, I want to be cast as a trans male character and uh, as a series regular in a show alongside an ensemble show alongside some stars that helped me elevate, you know, my work. I can learn from, but I don't have the pressure of carrying the show. Mm. And then, uh, it, yeah. right. Yeah. And it brings <laughs> me across it. But this, Cause this is 20, this was like 2017. So I wrote that in 2017 and then come 2018, I'm like, I put my feet in, in Los Angeles. I had a job to sort of hold me there. Then in April, I was like, I'm going back. I'm going to learn more about just kind of like the lay of the land or whatever. I'm going, I don't care. I'm going to go back. I'm going to stay there from April to June. And I'm just going to like learn, just be there because I keep saying I want to be there. Just go there. Mm. And I went. And then everything that I had wrote on that, in that like manifestation, like exactly what happened. I ended up booking um, the L word. So I'm like, yes. Oh my God. Like just that specific. So then I'm like, it's, 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 you know, I'm a couple, couple weeks into film the L word. I'm having a really great time, but I'm like, ah, 
something more. My friend was like, well, what, no, what do you, okay, what's your dream role? What, what would you want to do? I was like, well, I like action oriented stuff. So I want to work on an action oriented procedural where I'm playing a trans male character. It keeps me in Los Angeles. It increases my footprint. I wrote it down. And then like a month later, no, no, you're like, no, the day I said that he, I got a, I got the email for the audition for Lone Star. The day I said it out loud, he's like, what do you want? I, I said it out loud as, and I just put it into words. It was like materializing. I was feeling it and I was, I was feeling bad because I'm like, I, maybe I'm not being grateful for, you know, this experience I'm having on, on the L word. But I was like, but I want this. So just say it. Say and it. I did. And it, it happened. Just say it. You know, and, and, and I think a little bit of that's actor guilt, right? Mm-hmm. That we have because what we are always being told is we need to be thankful for the roles. We need to be thankful for the audition. We need to be like, I can hold two thoughts. I can be grateful and I can also say I'm available for more, more please. Right. Right. Yeah. And so you can, right. we, we, everybody, it's, it's just a, it's a, a group actor thing. I call it. Oh my God. Everybody's they, like, they, put it on, they put it on us. They're like, you know, there's so, there's only so many parts and we have this many submissions. You need to be, th- and I, I'm aware of it. So many of the people that I started my acting journey with in 2010, 2011, you know, they, they never made it here, you mm-hmm. know? So, and like, even on those hard days on set, where it's like, you know, you're all, you're, you're working, you're getting paid, but it's like, you know, things are out of order. You're going into hour 11. It's like, oh, oh, and you're just kind of going through it. Like I always was just like, why are you so content? I was like, because <laughs> I'm here. Yes. Like I've begged, borrowed, steal, you know, I did pretty much everything to get here. So yes. I'm getting, and I'm it, like, it, it'll be okay. Whatever's yeah. going on right now is temporary. It'll be okay. Cause I was right. getting, and I know how many of my peers and my friends never even had a series regular audition. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. they've been grinding just as long as I have, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? So it's like the fact that I, I even got the audition, mm-hmm. right? So I am grateful, but I can still follow my purpose. More please. Follow More please. Yeah. Yeah. Just follow the push. If that's what my purpose is pushing me toward, like it doesn't serve me or what I feel like I'm here to do if I resist it. <sighs> We're vibrating really high right now, <laughs> right? I love it. This is, this is where I always, we get to, I, I want to talk about this stuff, but I want to bring us down a little bit because you said you begged, borrowed, and stole. And the whole reason I wanted to get you on this podcast, I think you owe me $5. Uh-oh. I <laughs> <laughs> listen, you told me your Zen, your Zen mode, I'll get you. I'll get it back. I'll probably get it. But listen, I, I was, uh, I wanted to join the union, right? I did my, I did my background experience and like, you know, things were fine, but like, I realized that there's such a difference between how you're treated when you're sag and when you're not on a set. Yeah. And uh, this is Come. Cool. And this guy was like, uh, he, he'd been doing, he was like a professional background artist. He like shows up, he has his own police uniform, he used to be a cop. And like, he, this is bread and butter. And he's mm-hmm. as content as can be. And he's like, listen, brother, run, don't walk, join after right now. Cause you just paid the, to get in and they're going to merge. And he's like, no, people have been saying they're going to merge. He's like, no, no, they're going to merge. And he's like, do it. And I'm like, I don't have $1,600. And he's like, listen, this is the moment. This is the window. Yeah. So I said, okay. And I like looked at the little bit of money that I had. And I really asked everybody that I knew, like, I, I'm, I'm trying to say, y'all ask him. I put a little PayPal button on my <laughs> website, like, and just, I asked, and I was, and my mom, I was able to like get the money to, jo- to join after. And like, yeah three weeks later they merged and like now inside and i didn't have to pay the 3200 or whatever i was gonna say it's like four thousand dollars or something right now yeah i'm like i don't have if i didn't have 1600 no way i was gonna do that but it you know but it was just that it was like i scrimped say you know this you know god bless having a partner as understanding as my wife Mm -hmm. you know living in manhattan and just knowing like look i'm leaving full-time employment with salary and benefits because i can't do both you know and and like you know having her be like all right i got you and until yeah. you know, things went, you know, things started to, to like roll and like having faith in in my vision and having faith in you know what what I was trying to do as an artist. But yeah, I really had to. You, yeah, I, I, I had to like really swallow that pride. Like, listen, um, <laughs> and, but it's good to hear. I think everybody needs to hear that because sometimes I think what people do in their minds is they forget that we have been on that path too. Yes, right? mm-hmm. you know, we have a path. I have an episode that I did with my podcast when my parents came on. And I talked to my parents just about like, you know, the experience of having the son. Like when you see people on TV, just all that stuff. My parents haven't always been, you know, accepting of my career, but I think people forget that they think, oh, maybe he must have come from somewhere where people like praised him. I was like, that hasn't been the journey Mm -mm. always. So I, I think it's very enlightening. And we need to, as artists, 
always say, yo, there was a time that I had to ask for $5 to get that last Fifteen ninety five, just to get to the audition. Like, let me get yeah. six dollars to get to this audition. And yeah. Like, yeah, it's tough yeah. times, you know. It is, it is. But, but what's not tough though is that you got to meet Ava. I mean, I mean, can we can we just talk about that for a second? Because I want to hear about nine one one. And I know I'm taking up time, but I, I, I that's a juggernaut. You got to meet yeah. Ava D. <laughs> and I, I was again. It's that that power of manifestation. I met her. And David mm-hmm. Oyelowo at a talkback. SAG was doing, again, thank God for joining the union because SAG mm-hmm. does those screenings and talkbacks. Yeah. And some had came out and they did a talkback. And I just, I love the movie. And then listening to their process and how they worked. And I was like, oh, I want to work with this woman. Oh my gosh. And I, I got up, I went down there and I just shook her hand. I'm like, oh my gosh, I want to work with you one day. He said, oh, thank you so much. Bless your heart. You know? And I'm like, I'm, like, no, I'm serious. And I, I told my, uh, my manager at the time, like, I want to work with this woman, Ava DuVernay. And like, she had her own plan. So she was just like, okay. And it was a very, sometimes reps can't, from a, from a different generation kind of have a parental almost vibe to them where they're just like, you chill out my child and let me handle things. And don't you worry. And I'm like, no, I'm serious. I'm, I'm a grown person. I'm telling you what I want. Let's make this happen. How to make it happen. Like, I don't, I don't care if, if you facilitate it or whatever, but I'm serious. And, you know, she was like, oh, okay, let's get you some credits. I was like, oh, whatever. So then I ended up uh, leaving that manager. I started working with another manager. And I remember I sent an email to them, like, about the things I was interested in. I'm like, hey, I'm also really interested in working with April Verne. She's got some this project coming up and then blah, blah, blah. Then I found that Queen, she's making some project called Queen Sugar. Like, sent it to them, like, hey, I'm, she's making this project called Queen Sugar. And I was getting the same kind of thing. We're working on, some, we're cooking up stuff for you. Let's, you know, okay, you know, don't you worry. We got it. And I'm like, oh, okay. And then... One day I was on Facebook and a friend of mine who I did a teaching, a teaching artist workshop with was like, Hey, I'm trying to help a friend cast this project. We're looking for a black trans male cop. And I'm like, oh, I play cops, black trans. What's going on? Silas, I love you. You good dude. Wait, what's going on? I want to send my stuff. I don't even know what it is, but he's like, yeah, okay, great. Get the follow-up email. It's Queen Sugar. It's for Twan. I'm like, oh, Avery DuVernay show. Oh my God. I sent it to my people and it's like, blah, blah, blah. So I went from like that emailing about her and I still have all the emails I sent to both sets of reps to like the email from Ava. Hey, Brian, welcome to Queen Sugar. So glad to have you part of the family. Like she emailed me. Oh my God. Mm. And you know, again, like just not even, I like she wasn't the director for my episode, but the way she set up the production with mm. like, I never seen this many women. I never seen this many black women in like key department head position. Yeah. And the way things yeah. rolled there. And you know, like I went from like working on Blue Bloods in New York, where it's like exactly what you think of when you think of like production, where it's mm-hmm. like, you know, old Teamsters, white guys running everything, you know, yeah. maybe a black person here or there, but not really to like black women running things. We singing songs. It's soul food coming for catering. Like just, it felt like fam down there. Yeah. And, like, and, the, and not only that atmosphere, but then everybody's on top of their game and they love what they do and they love what they're working mm-hmm. on. So like the Avid effect is really a real thing. Because you feel these people, mm. with, I think what we're doing, like they're a very grateful that they're doing something, but they came to do something. And, and they're there to work. There. And they're, they're doing it. Work. And, they, and they know that they're, this is a great opportunity and they're going to give it their all, but they know that they're more than like this one thing that they're working on kind of thing. Yeah. And they just permeated everything. There was just this beautiful like confidence. And every, I feel like everybody who works in that show goes on to do whatever it is they probably vision for themselves. And it's just this set up thing for it. So that was amazing. And I did, you know, so we got to meet, we met um, at a couple of times, met at um, an award ceremony. And then we met the same night I met Oprah, which was like another like, I'm going to shut this podcast down. You met Oprah. I, I am not. Hey, what? hey <laughs> listen. And it was the day. It was that day I got the email about, um, about um, 911. The day I told my <sighs> friend, like, this is what I want to do. I went upstairs. Eating a slider, here come Oprah. Oh, <laughs> Fell out. I'll tell you, <laughs> you ain't got to say no more. You showing out now. You showing out. <laughs> you really just let me know to stay the course. Uh, thank you. The slider was good, delicious as well. But it, you know, you know, just again, like reminding me, like say what you really want. Yeah. Just say what you really want, and like what you want is okay. Like I really had to give myself to like permission again to be okay with what I want. That's you know. So good. You know, like I think my just my I think too my experience, you know, as trans, I think I learned to protect and cover up and hide my deepest desires because I don't know what the people I care about are going to do with that. You know what I mean? Like, I think I got in enough trouble, you know, when I was trying to express like, no, I'm, I'm a boy. And like this thing's like in the trouble that it would cause that I like learned. And like it was like this old thing that I was carrying. It's just like you don't 
don't fully say what you want. Don't or say what you need. Don't yeah, don't fully yeah. Don't say what you need. Don't don't. Yeah. Just say around you know. Just kind of put it out there a little bit. It's like no, you have to be specific. Mm. You have mm. to be specific for yourself, and then you have to be specific for the world. Because if you don't tell them what you want, then they're not gonna know what to do with you. You know, like I had this moment too. Where I was like, I I really wanted to work with Smith, Will Smith, and uh, I was trying trying to say like I'm doing everything and like. I just had the opportunity. I just had the opportunity. And I thought, like, what if I did have the opportunity? I walked into, they, they, I sent a letter. I sent a reply. Like, oh, great. You can come in at, you know, Tuesday at three o'clock. What? I would walk into the office. I would sit in front of them. I would have no idea because I haven't been specific about what I want. Besides, like, I just have a good vibe about you. And you have, it, I, I have, I'm not specific. So I was like, let me go back to the drawing board and be specific. About what is what is it that I want in this creative relationship with this person? What yeah. do I want? And then what would I give? What am I bringing to this collaboration? I don't know yet. So hang on. And hang on. Stop pushing for the opportunity until you have the thing. Until you have the specifics, until you have the specificity, yeah. like you were saying. And so mm -hmm. I, I just want to, you know, I'm being called to spend like 30 more seconds on this topic because mm -hmm. you have been dancing around, not dancing, you haven't, you've been specific about <laughs> it. When you say that you're giving yourself permission, that you're being specific, are you literally for the five-year-old, talk to me like I'm a five-year-old. Like, are you literally writing it down? Or do you literally making a vision board? What are you doing specifically in that world? Does that make sense? So, so if I'm if I'm if I'm sitting here and, yeah, and, no, and yeah, kind of kind of all of the above. Like I journal every day and like kind of write out my thoughts. Like I, you know, you can call it morning pages, whatever, but like I just kind of I've always had this sort of practice of like sort of writing because I will talk myself out of what I what I want if I don't write it down but when I it's just kind of stream of conscience I can just sort of write things down and then I'll get into like let's be specific and let's make this a plan and I'll make some bullet points sometimes I've gotten into making like uh, I'm trying to be more visual about things so like you know either putting up big pieces of note paper and sort of writing this stuff out and trying to be step by step until I got down to um spreadsheets because on uh, numbers you can like put pictures in there and you can, you know, so I, I the, the numbers on my computer would be like my, my vision board where I'd like grab images that I want and then bullet point here and there. So like I would literally craft like things that I kind of transferred over from what I discovered in the writing. So I'd be free writing and I would discover like, oh, you don't give it, you don't really, you have a hard time saying what you want and like that. So I have a discovery. And then from discovery, I was like, okay, well, what do you want? And I freehand write, like, what do I specifically want? Then I would copy and paste what I wrote as like the thing into the spreadsheet and then be like, what does that look like? And it's like, that would look like this. And if I need to grab an image from the internet, I'll grab an image. If I need to, I had a sketchbook at one point, I would just draw it, you know, like trying to really take the energy that was coming from me thinking about the things that I want and like putting it into something either I could physically act out or write out or draw or like see it like that you know so it was kind of both writing like you know one day I was like uh I really want you know in LA like what do you want so much about being in LA what would, how would you spend your time if, if I was in LA I would do and like so writing it out specifically I would do this and this time and and you know one thing that helped me get grounded when I first moved to New York was like I'm in the grind I have a job I don't feel I don't know what I want to do and I act just asking myself like what well, an ideal day, what would your ideal day look like? Mm. And then writing it out. And just in writing that out, it helped me sort of get clear on like, what do I want? What do I really want? You know, I didn't, I couldn't put a word to it. I couldn't say, I want this job. It was just like, this is how I want to spend my time. This and that, this and this. And all this stuff sort of started to kind of like clarify. So free writing helps me clarify. Once I get something out of that free writing bit, I get specific. And then I try to be visual. visual. Yeah. And then something that was really helpful with like moving my career along was um, having a big macro idea, whatever the big vision is, then what would be like the things that let me know I'm close things that need to happen in order for that to happen. So, the, so like the, the big steps and then like the tasks I could do today towards that. Mm -hmm. So then like, I would put it in my, I literally take the task. Like, so I break it down. Here's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to book a series regular role on queen sugar, the walking dead, or 911, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. To know that I'm doing it, I would be auditioning for these kinds of roles. I would be, uh, you know, getting called in or whatever. And then uh, the 
the little tasks I could do in the day would be like, go over my headshots and see if I have any headshots that match any of the roles I'm interested in. Mm-hmm. Take a look at, you know, talk to my uh, cat, my reps about the breakdowns and what are they seeing in terms of what's going on. Look at my headshots and see if they are in line with that. If my headshots are in line with that, great. If they're not, what do I need to do to change my headshots to get the headshots that are in line with this? It's, you know, look what's going on in my reel. Does my reel have anything on that suggests action oriented uh, character? Sorry about this beeping sound. My car's trying to take off. Trying uh, to go. Trying know, to go. But I did act, yeah, just acting, you know, uh, act, things that I could actually do. So that way, if I go to bed, I can say at least I did one thing in the step mm. that I'm actually trying to go in. You know, yeah. so even when so when I was working my day jobs, I had nothing to do with anything. I didn't get bogged down by it because this was part of my plan. It was like make enough money to not worry about bills. So that's why I have this day job. So that's part of my plan. And then something that's very specific towards it is I can uh, find a scene to record that would be good for my reel. So I'm while I'm at work getting my money, doing one task. Mm-hmm. towards my main goal and that kept me going where other people were getting like lost in the sauce and the office drama and the politics and stuff like that like i'm like mm, you know mm-hmm. yeah you know i love that because i i usually thought about well i got to a place where my day job was my investment job i started thinking about it i got this job so you can pay for them headshots so i can pay for these classes so I can, and i just thought about it you know towards the end but it took me a while to get to that place yeah um, i love that i love everything i love how you broke it down i think it's really going to be very helpful for people out there and I, I because i think you should be able to also what i try to bring into it is a vivid vision yeah. Right. And being in that vivid vision and something Oprah said, you know, in one of the meditations I do, and she was like, without a vision, the people perish. You know what I mean? And so I think that you do have to have it. But I love how you get super specific. Like, I want to work in Marvel. You know what I mean? But I was like, do I want to work in the Marvel or do I want to be a superhero in this? And, I, and so I started to get a little bit more like, let me just get specific about what I want to do. Mm-hmm. How do I want to play this? So I, I, I really love that. Um you know, Brian, I, I want to make sure that I get to 911 because I, we love to talk about on this podcast the road to series regular, right? Mm-hmm. Just the road to series regular. I want to get there real quick. And I just, if, if you if you feel like walking us through it, walk us back to like, I got the email, I got the appointment, you know what I mean? Like, and I booked it. I just, we want to walk to this oh. road of like, how did you prepare for that audition? You know what I mean? Or, or, you, or did you just say, this me, I check all the boxes. I'm here. I just want to hear all of that. Can we start there? Yeah, like I told you the day I got the, the thing, I was all I was uh, at a screening with a friend of mine and he'd asked me like, what I want to do. And I just started to put into words, you know, they are like, this is what I want to do. And then I got the email. I'm like, oh, my goodness. So it, it had, uh, I think, three days in between mm-hmm. when I got the email to when the appointment was going to be. It's like, oh, I got it. I get to go to Fox Studio. This is all the first for me. Usually I do tapes where I go to like some small casting offices, like going to a studio in LA. So I'm like, oh, woo. you know, let's get ready for that. And then it's like, all right, let me take a look at the uh, sides. See, and when I read the sides, it's like, sometimes I read it and I can see the situation very clearly. I'm already having like a response to what is there. And I know why this is being said and I make a connection really like quickly. And then sometimes it's like there's parts of that make I make connection really quickly to and there's parts like I'm not quite clear on. And then then I have just a bunch of questions. So when I that first used to have me, I was like, oh, I don't get it right away. Something's wrong with me. And it's just like, no, no, no. A script is a series of problems to solve. That's my job as an actor, solving problems. Right. So it's like <laughs> if I look at it like that, then it's like this gives me something to do. This is the work. Okay. So this is why when I have a coach. I feel like I'm not wasting my time because the coach is going to help me with the problems I can't answer myself mm-hmm. or to tease out things that I may not have seen. Right. So I got it. I looked at the, the script. There was things that like totally clicked. And then there were things that were like, mm-hmm. how do I, you know, okay, I don't know. but I really want to get with my coach because I want, I want to get, you know, do my best. So I call up the uh, coach that I was seeing out in, uh, in Los Angeles. And uh, you know, he, I was like, well, let's get it together. Let's work on this. Cause also I'm, I'll be raw in my own sort of get it together process and just kind of work here and there and like whatever. But then I got to work on being in the frame. So that's why I also like to be with the coach. Cause then I get to, before I get into the room, I get to practice being in the room and like in the frame. So I'm not doing it on the day, <laughs> trying to like put my performance into the frame on the day. It's like, I've kind of already worked it out and saw what was there, what was there. So I got with the coach. I'd worked on this thing. I, we, I had some questions about like, all right, in this scene, I totally get it, but this doesn't ring true. And I don't know if I would do it like this. And, you know, just being reminded, like, you know, when it's a series regular, you know, do what's on the page, but then also do what feels right 
for you based on what you feel about it. So I, I prepared it kind of both ways. And what does then, that mean? What does that mean? What you just well, said? What does that mean specifically? When I produce what's on the page, it's like exactly as it's written, kind mm-hmm. of trying to verbatim, word for word, what is written in terms of the character's dialogue. And even sometimes, sometimes the stage direction, because sometimes the ca- what the camera's doing it goes with the storytelling. So you kind of have to do what, what goes there. Sometimes I do it exactly as it's written, but then sometimes exactly as it's written, bumps up against what I feel like the situation is making my body want to make against the behavior that the scene is engendered in me as the artist. So I'm like, ah, you know, so either I have to learn how to justify what's going on in there. So the behavior flows through it or just use the script as a springboard and let the behavior be the behavior and, and go with that. Whether it's like how I say it, how I'm responding, why I'm responding the way I'm responding. Whatever the behavior is, I'll, let the be, I'll do one take where it's like I made them like this and I'll do another take where it's like I made it like this, where my behavior is coming off. Um, okay. So that's what I did with the coach. And then I felt confident. But then I was like, I also like to rehearse before I go into the audition. So then I got with my acting friend, uh, Margaret, and we we ran it like in the like in the space. So like in if the one scene took place in a locker room, then it was like we did it in a space that felt like a locker room. Like by the sink. So I could just sort of get it in my bones, like the real whatever. So that when I get into the frame, I had, you know what I mean? It's in my, it's in my body a little bit as like a fully lived out thing. And I'm not just pantomiming nonsense because, you know what I mean? Like I, it makes sense to me. I do a walk and talk. Like if I have a walk and talk, I'll go walk down my street. I'm going to walk down, like, you know, and then I, and then I bring it back to the space, but it's already in my body that I've done that walk and talk. Do you know what I mean? Because when you get on set, we don't, we're not, I mean, you know, this we're not going to be walking in place, but you still have the movements and stuff. So I hear you. We we vibe. Keep going. Right here. Right. Mm -hmm. So so I did that. And then again, like just to, again, get it in my body, get, get the, and then I don't always rehearse the scene. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I will just play out the situation that is informing the scene. Mm -hmm. So I'll improv with my acting friend, like the subtext of why my character is probably acting this way in the scene that's on the page. So like, if I need to be guarded, then I'm going to rehearse being very vulnerable Mm -hmm. so that I come in very vulnerable. So that when I'm in the scene, I like lock it up and guard myself but I have something to guard, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? As opposed to pretending to, you know what I mean? So like, I'll get that all in my body, you know, forehand. So it, 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 I'm not, it's, but it's behavior, not an idea. I don't know if that makes sense. That's clear. So I, that's what I did with my, my friend in, in the beforehand. It's like, we did the scene just to kind of get the words on my mouth and use the mechanics of it. And then we rehearsed what I felt like I was the subtext situation. So in the scene that we ended up doing, it was uh, from scene, from the first scene of um, the second scene in the pilot, when Paul Strickland's in the in the locker room and he's like checking a pimple, and the the captain walks in and catches him off guard, and he um, is feeling really vulnerable. And then you come to find out the captain's like down. He's like, "Here's some information on skincare," and they have this really cool bonding moment that's kind of like on its head, you know, where like here's the the male the captain the, the the manly man is like teaching me about skincare, and we're bonding over that, and he's letting me know that he's got my back. So that's the gist of the scene. But what has to happen is I have to be very embarrassed. I have to be, you know, guarded or whatever. I have to be vulnerable. And I'm like, I would be if I'm trans mm-hmm. and I'm in a new space and yeah. I just came from a place where I had a hard time. Everybody gave me a hard time. So I was already super guarded. Here I am in this new space being guarded and I'm getting caught doing something that pulls, you know, pulls attention to me and my differences. I'm like, ah, I'm alarmed and I'm guarded, right? But the line that they had written that didn't sit well with me was like the captain asked him what's he doing as I'm checking my pimples. And then he just volunteers all this information. I'm checking my pimples because I take testosterone and it causes acne. And I'm like, that not gonna do it. I'm not going to volunteer all this information. Mm-hmm. In public, like there's other people in here. This is a guy I'm, I want to respect. That's private. And, yeah. you know, I'm thinking to myself, like, you know, most people I know who aren't like, and I think of my, even my own friendships. I never said to like, people I've known for like 10, 11 years. I've never said like, I take testosterone. Like that's just yeah. whether I do or not, like, it's just not a thing first meeting no it's not it's not happening and it's not necessary Mm -hmm. and it doesn't play into what's happening in the moment where this man is like caught off guard so i did it one as written then i did it the way like i would do it It was just like uh being vague some of the stuff i have to take causes acne and i got pimples pimples and then the guy's like okay and then now he's not being so he's being he's interested and he's not and now but he's 
is he judging me? So then I'm guarded again, but in a different way where it's like, oh, you get pimples. I use this stuff. You know what? How do you wash your face with soap and water? You soap and water. And I'm like, you know, but now it's, it's a different sort of reaction and different response. And then, you know, when he, when I talk about at the end, when I'm expressing gratitude, Hey, people would typically tiptoe around me. I need to know what that's like to be tiptoed around. So yeah, I can call back from experiences in my life when I was tiptoed around, but then I can also have this person here. We can rehearse her staring at me and like thinking, real thoughts and like wanting to ask me personal questions but then not so that we rehearse like stuff like that so that i i had that kind of in me and alive in me. So when i went you know, sitting in me so when i and then it helped out when i was in the waiting room because it's the same thing this scene is about a job interview how would i be sitting in the waiting room with all the other firefighter candidates in the job interview wondering what they're thinking and what's going on i just kind of stayed in that yeah yeah and then so you did the audition you got you, you did the audition, you booked it or was it a couple auditions or i was so surprised this is my very first series regular audition i was very prepared for the call back to produce the session the chemistry i was prepared i'm like what's going on and they were like my team got back to me and they're like this was the offer this, this is like offer i'm like okay so when i go back to the, the camera test like no brian they offered you the role like that's it so i was Shocked. Brian's like, I, I, no, hear me. I'm like, Brian, what's the rest that happened? He's like, no, no, no. I'm like, can you tell me the other parts? <laughs> what else do I need to be doing? I need to be ready. You know, and they're like, no, you got it. Now you just got to like, you know, show up and do X, Y, and Z. I'm like, oh my gosh. So that was incredible. A, is that I didn't have to jump through all of the other nerve wracking hoops, you know, and like, we're going to get started. Then I had to, you know, get ready for like, okay, well, how do I get ready for what's happening? Yeah. Which is going to be like, I'm going to be playing a firefighter. Like, let me start researching firefighter let me start researching chicago let me start researching i just started researching i was looking up everything that had yeah. anything to do with my character um waiting to get like my hands on the full script and that was another thing like i was kind of tempted it was like do i wait to get this it's like no don't wait to get the script just you there's all this other stuff that probably not even in the script that you need to know for your you know for your character for your own sake so i started that sort of rehearsal process and then the physicality of being a firefighter, you know, like mm -hmm. I was, I lived around the corner from a firehouse and like, I was waiting for them to like say when there's going to be training, but like we were getting close to the date and they had context about training. So I just like, let me just go on down this firehouse. <laughs> and, uh, hey guys, some cookies. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that was definitely pre COVID. That was definitely oh, pre COVID. Yeah. Like oh, I, had yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I have, I have to say that this story is so inspiring. You know, it is uh, so relatable. It is um, tangible. We can take stuff from, you know, so I really appreciate you breaking it down for everybody in the Think Picker Tribe who's listening to it that way. And I just want to say thank you from all of us, all of us. I just, I just, I just got one more question for it. Just one more quick question is that what, what would Brian right now say to younger Brian who was starting out in the industry, you know, like wait, just starting in the industry, you know, you're like, what's up, what's up? Like, I, and you might have had some thoughts, some I'm not good enough, or will this ever happen? I don't know, but I just want to know, like, what would Brian right now say to younger Brian? I would say your no's define you. So say no if it doesn't really do anything inside of you. What does that mean? Your nose define you. Go ahead. Like if you say yes to everything, you'll diffuse yourself. You'll you'll overextend yourself. You won't be able to show up in the fullness of who you are as an artist or as a person. You probably won't even have like the energy to do it, or you'll just be involved in things. If no one's going to have an idea of who you are, more probably you're not going to know who you are. So if something doesn't resonate for you or really interest you, even if somebody's telling you this is a good idea for you to do, or this is what so and so did, say no. That's say good. no until you it's something like, oh, I really want to do it, you know, because it nothing feels worse than giving your like showing up, giving your time to something you don't really want to do, it, and then it comes out and you don't even want to share it. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And it's like, well, I did it because it doesn't matter. The because it's not strong enough. You didn't really want to do it. Mm -hmm. And you did it. And that's now on your reel. It's on your IMDB. It's attached to you. It's associated with it. You And people are going to think that's your best. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you're showing up and you're kind of like not fully invested in it, your performance is probably not going to be fully that. And people are going to see it and think that's your best. So mm -hmm. if you're not going to give 100% to something, if you're not really in, interested in somebody or working with somebody, just say no. That's a word. 
that's a word because people do think that last thing or that thing you did is your best because why would you why would you be choosing that you know yeah 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 i have to say that right i could i could really talk to you for another hour you have <laughs> there's so much stuff that that i i, I just you're just so god ah. <laughs> I I like, this was great it was very much like a conversation i like I'm, it really was vibing together so I'm, I'm so glad that you took the time to do this with me no thank you for taking time to just to share your story with other actors you know like are out there doing the doing the, the hustle the strive like I, I call it instead of the thrive you're you're, you're yeah. definitely you know out there uh, making your strides and so Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming on to the Think Bigger Actions podcast. We appreciate you. Yes, thank you for having me, man. I don't carry fear. Did you catch that? Did you catch that moment? <laughs> oh, Brian, that was so good. He said, I say, there you are. Oh, I need some help. Or I know it's there. I just don't carry it. I don't try to stop it and pretend like it's not happening. I acknowledge it and keep moving. Okay, Brian, I see you. I see you. Oh, half the stuff we are fearful of is somebody else's stuff. You know, we are worried about bothering casting directors. We're worried about being too much, worried about doing the wrong thing, worried about being that actor. And yes, let's be clear. Worry is just fear in disguise. Come on, somebody. You're not fooling anyone with that worry. Half of what we are fearful of is just borrowed people's beliefs, borrowed beliefs, and those beliefs have expired. It, it, it's time to step into a new consciousness of the actor in this modern day experience, because why are we still living the thoughts and experiences of past coaches or past actors? Why are we settling for this is the only way to become successful? That is how, you know, Bobby or Kim or Melinda did it. Take what you are learning and remember, this is the final agreement that I always say, I always say, put your stank on it. Don't be fearful. Put your stank on it. You are the difference. You are the elevation. Do not conform to what you think someone else wants. Learn from all these clues, this podcast, this roadmap, and remember to always go back to how do I want to make this my own? How do I want to make this my own? This might be my favorite D12 shot ever. This is a go back and listen to it. This is a I will get what Dewan is dropping down at 3 a.m. Hawaii time two days from now because how do I want to make this my own? Put your stank on it. Stop borrowing other people's beliefs and make this stuff your own. All the stuff we're doing, all the stuff I'm doing. Success leaves clues. You can't be Brian. You can't be Dewan. You must go back and put your own stank on it. Listen to me when I tell you this. This is your portal jump. You know I had to bring it for Pride Month. <laughs> he said, this is your portal jump. I promise you, this is your portal jump. We're always looking for what do the casting director want? What do the director want? What do they want? I wish they would just tell me what they want. They want you. They want you to come in, understand what the scene's about, understand what this uh, genre is, understand the tone, understand all of that, and then put your stink on it. And don't be fearful. That's your portal jump. Oh, man, I love this. I love what I get to do. I love how I get to show up in your life. Go share this. Go share this and tell them about portal jumping. Tell them about all this Pride episode. This is so good. It's so good. And you know I'm going to ask. You know you know what to do. This is how we get it out there to more people. Come on, share this episode. Let other people know about the Think Bigger Actors podcast because you know what? I'm over here having a lot of fun all by myself, and I want to make sure that it gets out to more people. Thank you so much for continuing to join us. Thank you so much for writing me, for DMing me. I see you, Nicole. I see you people in my inbox. I see all of you. I really, really, really do. It is me. Thank you. I will repost every comment. Comment, every thank you that you guys are sending out there. Happy Pride Month, y'all. I will see you soon.